Great. There it goes. Okay, there you go, Jean. Okay. So, um, this first one is how to download um, sequences and, and deal with editing of sequences. So, we have two groups that have done something with this. Jack, have you done any sequence editing? Yes, a bit. A bit, okay. And then Sigrid, I know, has. Right, um, not always super great though, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> uh -huh. So Sigrid, what, what is it that you use um, when you're editing? Um, I, knew, I use Snap Gene Viewer, which is a free program, which yeah. I know is not the best, um, but you know, it's it works. Free. It's free. Yeah, <laughs> it's free, and it works for one direction. You can't you can't line up both forward and backward at the same time. Correct. Yes. And yeah. I usually just do forward to pull my chain. So. Yeah. And Jack, what are you using? Uh, I use that, and that's what I used in school too. Okay. All right. Yeah, it has the, the disadvantage of it is really nice to be able to see both sides of your sequence and to actually use them to align. Yeah, yeah, um, but, but that's expensive. For us, that step is actually done by bold. Except, Except in, the circum in some circumstances, yeah. Okay, so, so if bold is getting a somewhat messy sequence in one or both directions, um, they'll lop off the ones that are ambiguous to the program that, that transcribes these. Um, and I can go in and look at that and, and skim across and say, I think this is salvageable. This is um, a collection which is of high value because it's maybe the only one of, of that species or a um, fungus, but generally yeah. we don't recommend you do this because it no. just takes time. Yeah. So I, I do manually do um, making that um, alignment and, and using another. That means I'm going to skip over a lot of this on the, on the details because it's not going to be relevant to you. So you're actually in bold right now, not in your slideshow, just, just to ah. let people know that. All right, I got to stop sharing. I, I had pulled bold up also. Um, and share the other one. Thank you. So how to download the sequences, edit them, upload sequences to bold when there isn't one to replace. Um, so in bold, when you're on the main, um, sequences page, um, or the main, the main page that has your records, um, you can hit on the link on the left, which gives you the, the specimen record. So that was the one we were editing on Thursday that has the name, what it is you want to call it, any notes. Um, all of that. If you hit on the one on the right, um, which is the sequence page, um, then you can get in and look at what's going on in the sequences. Um, and there is a button for download the traces. And so those are the chromatograms. Um, you can copy those. Um, either out of the, the main sequence page, it's got a little block, um, or if there isn't one, you can get in and download the trace file and copy what's there from, from the trace file. That means you have to copy it and then open it in your snap gene. And then you may get enough sequence, even if it's 150 base pairs, which um, bold might not show because it, you know, it says no failed. <laughs> uh, it might be enough to blast and see if, if the original um, ID from the collector makes sense. Okay. 
So you're going to download the uh, trace files um, and then pick it up from your snap gene and use the blast in, in GenBank. Um, you don't have sequencer, so you can't take the two and align them together forward and reverse. You can't use a reference sequence, which I use, which is the, the closest match in GenBank. Put it as a reference so that it's not changing what the consensus is. And then look at every base and say, is it or isn't it this? <laughs> and in, in all those places where you have two bits of information from chromatograms, that's very helpful. Um, so then you get the information, um, you know, as to whether this thing makes sense. If you think it makes sense, um, and you can do some editing by eye in, um, in uh, SnapGene, then you can upload that sequence. So before I go on to that, um, there are a few tricks to editing sequences that you may or may not know. One is that um, you can get, ITS has multiple copies because there are multiple um, ribosomes in the fungus and those don't always agree. And you can have, particularly if you have a mushroom, you have mama mushroom and papa mushroom, which have different um, nuclei that stay separate. And, and, you know, there may also be ribosomes, you know, associated with the two parents. So what happens is that um, if they don't agree on a particular position, particularly if um, one of them has a, a single base or two base insertion, that's not present in the others, you get what's called a frame shift. And so normally, um, you know, all of the reads should line up and it should be a nice, clean chromatogram. You see all just a single thing in a, in, um, a hump, which corresponds to a particular base. But if you have a place where there's been an insertion then you can get suddenly this, this shift in some of those reads and it's like a moire. So how do you know which one is the correct one and which one is garbage? You know, is, so pay attention to spacing because there tends to be, except sometimes when you're on the ends, um, a very regular spacing between um, your chromatogram humps. And if there's one of these, which, which looks like it's halfway or a third of the way or two thirds of the way across from where the other spacings were, ignore that one and go for the other one. Then you can develop a pattern that it's the one on the right that's the correct one and the one on the left is the wrong one. And those can run in a string um, for many bases, but then they can shift back on top and then go the other way. With, when you're dealing with snap gene, you can only correct so far, but you can, you can try that if you're desperate to get a longer sequence, try blasting it again, and then look at the part that you corrected and, and look at the alignment in, in gene bank and see if that's making sense in terms of what it's pulling up or whether it's saying there are a bunch of mismatches on what you just did. Okay. <laughs> now, let's say you've got something that you want to- In other to words, this, this all can take a while to develop a feel for it. But if you yeah. do spend a lot of time looking at sequences, you do begin to see what Jean's talking about in terms of spacing patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah and figuring out which is, it's the one on the right or the one on the left, which is the correct peak. Yeah. You do also get, because um, of these differences in real differences, um, you can get double peaks. 
So let's say you're getting everything looks lined up. There's no problem. But on one of them, um, let's say this one, you've got two different um, bases that are being called. Let's say an A and a T. That may be real. You know, if, if the amplitude of those humps is close, they're not skewed, there's not other stuff going around like a frame shift, um, that is more likely to be um, real. You can leave it as to what the program called it. There is a way to, to um, indicate that it's actually an A and a T. And you'll see those in the, in the GenBank reads. And so it may have some weird thing like why. And then it doesn't say that yours is a mismatch. It's not a mismatch because it's matching one of those two. All right. So don't panic on that. Leaving it as is works, but, but there are some finessing things you can do. GenBank, or not GenBank, but um, Bold actually calls those ambiguities and you'll see an ambiguity count. Um, but in some cases, it's, it's not ambiguous, it's that that's real. <laughs> so um, I did finally get, um, how many of you are familiar with um, Unite platform for, for blasting sequence? It's mostly European, right? I sometimes run things through it because they have things that blast, doesn't it? Yeah, but see, they had an algorithm initially um, that was screening out things that had um, X many ambiguities. But in Hygrosophy, which is the group that I usually work in, they, they usually have a number of things and they're not ambiguous, they're really double peaks. So I got them to um, back off on, on calling them ambiguous and screening all of those out. <laughs> So one, one thing you guys should be aware of is that the vast majority of the environmental sequences are run through UNITE, or what, which is a different pronunciation of what Gene's talking about. And that means that they've had, to a very large degree, European names associated with them. Um, we are working on this problem. Uh, me and a bunch of other colleagues, but it's still a real problem with Bold. It's probably, I mean, sorry, with Unite. It's mostly European. However, we have gone through and, and validated bunches of records that came out of GenBank so that, yep. that we do have ones in there that are from here. Which, which is true, but it's also true that, um, so I used Unite on, on 100 of our sequences, mm -hmm. and it was kind of remarkable how little it helped. Yeah. <laughs> At that level, it, it's not that helpful. But if let's say you have something that could be a European species, you can take your sequence, put it in the search box and search. And then you can go down to this thing called species hypotheses. And, and you can adjust the percent match level from 3%, 2.5%, 2%, 1.5%, and, and see whether that's fitting in with the European sequences and at what level. So I and that's that. useful. Yeah, I, I did that. And, and again, out of 100, maybe four were any sort of a match at all to a species hypothesis. Yeah. So, I mean, which is also telling you how many of our sequences are of things that are really not known. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In, in the Hygrophorase E, uh, particularly Hygrosabe, Cufophilus, uh, Gliophorus, it's running about 85% um, are not on both sides of the Atlantic, 15% both sides of the Atlantic. So. But what I was talking about on Thursday, a lot of this depends on whether you've got something that, that's typically a Northern European Scandinavian species, in which case it's much more likely to be um, circumpolar going all the way around on, on high latitudes. And 
it's not only because things that are from the high latitudes um, are more tolerant of being whipsawed across hot, cold, hot, cold. Um, it's also because the continents are closer together up there. You get into the, the tropics and, and the expanses of the oceans is huge. And so it doesn't mean that some of those species aren't able to cross from Africa into um, Central America um, or South America. It's just infinitely smaller probabilities. <laughs> and then you can also have accidental introductions. One of the ones that um, showed up with a cherry tree, which is a wood rotter up in um, Washington state. Um, it, it appears to be an undescribed species from China, but we know that the nursery people, you know, move a lot of material from, from China and Japan to, and, you know, stuck it in the US and that's where we got a lot of very diseases. And so this was a latiparous. And so, you know, it's not something that has a, a broad distribution in the state, but it, it certainly does look like something that was introduced accidentally from, from China. We also have the situation though of, of phylogenetic connections to mm -hmm. Asia. For oh yeah. For example, in the Pacific Northwest, our, the closest relatives of Douglas fir are in Taiwan and China. Yeah. Uh, and of course, yes, they are moving pathogens, unfortunately, from those places into the US now. Yeah. So so there are reasons to to look outside of your own region if you can't find a match in your region or within North America. Um, so you've got this sequence now. You had a blank box in in the bold sequence page. Um, so they're not showing any sort of sequence at all in that blank box. And they, they have a little flag there that says failed, failed. <laughs> and you want to put it in. Okay. So um, you go out to the main console in bold. And, and that's what, what you get when you first log in. Um, and up in the upper right are these blue boxes. And, and this one here says sequences. And that little thing says upload. So you hit this button. Uh, and it pulls up this entry box. Um, so the default here is select the type of ID, and then it says process ID. That's the one you wanna leave, keep it that way. That's your um, NAMP A number, 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 dash, and then the two year, two, two digit year code, okay? Um, markers, you have to change that. It says COIS5P. That's, that's a gene that, um, as Biddy was saying, this was originally set up by, by a fly person and then used for, for um, beetles and other stuff. That's, that's an insect barcode that's not relevant to us. You have to hit on um, this to get the pull down menu and hit the one that says ITS. Don't hit the one that says ITS1 or ITS2, yeah. <laughs> hit the one that just says ITS. And then um, you have to enter a run site. Um, for SIGRID, what, what would you put for an institution? I usually put down, um, sorry, um, I put down New York Mycological Society. Okay, and it, it should take that, okay. Mm -hmm. And then you two can take um, probably Evergreen College, Jack and Lauren. Or our, our own Myco clubs too. It'll we'll take stay that. We'll stay affiliated with them. We haven't tried, but that's what yeah. we will try. But you can, you can flip around. Um, 
I don't know if it would take the counterculture lab that um, that um, uh, Rockefeller Allen's using. Um, for him, I would tell him to use University of Berkeley because he has an association with with Bruns. Um, I have to put in University of Georgia, I but have you have here. to. I have one here that I use. Yeah. Um, so you have to hit one that's that's in the pull down list, basically. It won't just take a a um, new entry. Um, and then you need to put it put in the sequence as a, a FASTA file. Now, um, Jack and Lauren, you know the format for FASTA file. Yeah. So you have the little carrot, right hand carrot mark, the NAMP A, your number, 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 dash, YY, you know, your, 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 um, that's from your process ID. So that's how it knows which one it is. And then you go to the next line and, and paste in your sequence, and then you hit submit. And if you did it right, well, this is what that page should look like. Um, and I use University of Georgia and there's your submit button. And it should pop up with um, sequences created one. Okay. So that's how you know what it, you know, that you got it through. Um, you can hit search records if you want to look at it and just double check it. Um, it tells you how many bases were in what you uploaded. Um, and, you know, it's just basically your, your record screen, but only for that one record. So pretty easy. Um, if you wanna view that new sequence, this is the, the sequence page. You hit on, um, NAMP A in, in that one that we had open. And it pulls up this, which is the sequence page. You should now have your sequence showing up in this um, sequence box and uh, the illustrated barcode above it. Okay. If you have comments, which you may, about the sequence and you if you've edited one, like in your snap gene, and you've lengthened it, um, you should say um, in the comments boxes for either up at the, the top where it has it for uh, the chromatograms or associated with the individual chromatogram that you edited um then you should you should put who you were that edited it and whether you linked it lengthened it corrected it or both if, if you didn't have um both sequences so you were just ed editing a single sequence uh, you mm -hmm. should say that because there's less certainty in what you do when that happens yeah so let me let me do a quick change out i'm gonna take you into bold. Um, okay, you're, you're back on my screen, correct? Or not? We're not seeing anything right now. We are okay. seeing Jean's screen, which is what she wants. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Cause I've, it unshared me automatically. Okay, share screen, bold, share, okay. So now it says you can see what I've got here. I'm going, this is the main screen. That's where you do the sequence upload. I'm going into NAMP A, where I've got sequences. View all records. Every time you go in, you gotta 
resort those by the sequence page. This is yeah. all standard. This is you'll do this uh -huh. a thousand times. <laughs> okay, so so I'm gonna pull up a nice looking sequence. Yeah, let's get a barcode compliant one. So I'm gonna pull this one up. Um, there's the barcode, there's the sequence. Um, and tags and comments. Okay, here, this is for if you are editing um, like the two, the forward and the back um, together. Okay. Um, but this one is a comment on the forward read, and this one's a comment on the reverse read. And if you want to look at these and eyeball them and see if it's even worth trying to correct them, you just click on that picture and then pull the slider, and you can see how nice those are looking. We aren't actually seeing that page, Gene. You'd have to. Oh, I got to unshare and yeah. reshare. Unfortunately, Sorry. this doesn't work very well for um, actually demonstrating, which is why we had to wow. make the stupid slideshows. <laughs> Uh, no, no, it won't show the pop up. No, it is. Okay, I think I've got it. We were hearing you just fine. Okay, can you see the chromatograms now? Yes, we can. Yeah. So, so one thing I will say is that we um, were early on. We were always writing validated for each sequence, and we stopped doing that at some point. We just validated for the whole record. Yeah. Because it was just but too if, much time. But if if you've edited something or lengthened something, you need the comment. Put a comment in here. <laughs> if that was the one that you edited, or if this was the one that you edited, put your comment down in here. So somebody going back knows that you that, that sequence was edited and who did it. Okay. But if you want to see these. And you, you can know, see these are quite good sequences. Yeah. Even down okay. at the very end. Yeah. See, you could you could even eyeball those and say, oh yeah, that's a G-A-C-T-T-T. -T -T. You know, there's no problem reading those. <laughs> but you you can't see the colors anymore because they've grayed them out. So you'd have to download that sequence into your snap gene, read those extra ones. You know, but already we're up at 700. So basically, this one is not worth lengthening. No. Because you're up in the primer area. That stuff's not going to change. <laughs> so it's it's only, you know, if, if you're down around 400 or 500 and you really desperately want a longer sequence because it's a valuable record. No. OK. So I'm going to stop sharing on that one. Go back to and we're done with this one. Any questions on that part? No, that's pretty clear. Um, I've used Mega. In the uh -huh. past, have you guys used it or have any opinions on it? I have not okay. used Mega. Okay. It's for a document. Oh, it's just okay, cool. Thank you. Can can you um, see both the forward and back read at the same time? Yeah, yeah. And there's a few different functions, but it's kind of glitchy and it I've had my work lost on it before because it, it's a, it was a beta program. So um but that's the one that I used in uh, my class. And I also at the key council, they had us, uh, Matt Gordon did a workshop and he had us use Mega as well. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, mean, I use an expensive one, but I love it because it, I don't lose things on it. It's called Genius. Yeah. yeah. What's it called, Biddy? Genius. Mm -hmm. Genius. Yeah. And, 
a DNA subway for creating consensus sequences. That's a free online tool. What's it called? DNA subway. DNA subway. I'll mm -hmm. check it out. It's really good. It's a very fun, interactive thing. Good. I have to try it too because I hate spending the money. Well, actually, what I do is I, I talk a student into doing it, then I pay for it through them. And it only costs me a few hundred dollars a year that way. <laughs> I've been using an old, old version of Sequencer, which is why I have a computer that's running Sequencer that no longer talks to the internet. <laughs> so, all right. Next one up. Um, but Sequencer is like two and a half thousand dollars. <laughs> okay. So giving submitters access to their records. So Allie, who's been our um, data manager coordinator, um, has been very helpful on this. Um, some of the projects um, that are in Fundis have a lot of contributors, like Steve Ness's group. Um, and others have only a single person or two people with, with a lot of records. Um, for them, um, we've, we've set up separate projects. But um, for, for them, we've actually exported or moved um, their records from NAMP A to a new project. Um, but most of the people, their records are embedded in NAMP A. And, that, and, and I actually prefer it when they're in NAMP A because yeah. then I have easy access to them and it's easier yeah. for me to see if a whole plate has gone wrong as yeah. recently happened. Yeah. But the reason why we have to export some of them to new projects is because uh, you're, you're limited in how much you can do in bold unless you have your own project. Yeah. Uh -huh. So people like, Steve Ness and Fred Rhodes, who who have who freak out if they can't manipulate their own sequences, have to have their own projects. Yeah, but and, again, and it, they it want to a, change the name or yeah, the ID. It's a nightmare for us um, yeah. organizationally, so yeah. we try not to do it very often. No, we've got th three or four, maybe three, main projects other than Nampe. So so these data. These um, people who have their records embedded in NAMP A, um, you have to give them access, but you only want to give them access to their records, not everybody's. So what you do is you move those records to a data set, but that data set is actually nested within NAMP A. And it's like mirrored. So if you make changes in the records in that user's data set, that change is also reflected in, in the NAMP A version. So you can make a change in either place and it shows up in the other place. So um, the only other thing that's important to know about our database for you guys is that all of our records are linked to iNaturalist or uh, Mushroom Observer and that's coded in that specimen ID. That is not changeable. Thankfully. Yes. <laughs> um, so let's say we want to take somebody's new sequences that have showed up and we want to make them available to the submitter or the project leader. Um, and so we have to, to move those records um, from NAMP A into a new user data set. So we've gone in, we opened up um, the see all records, we've done our sort by sequence page, and I'm saying, okay, this person only submitted um, three sequences, so they only get three sequences in their data set. Um, so those are the ones I've marked that we're going to export. Um, 
or mirror essentially mirror Next yeah it, but it's mirror their their term is is moved um and they don't use the term mirror but that's exactly what it is so um you can also alternatively create a data set um, on the data council. Um, so you can um, open up options, choose the, the second option, which is add records uh, to a data set. Which you might do if you already have an active data set and yeah. that group has gotten, you know, 15 more sequences. Mm -hmm. You're going to want to update the first project with the data from the next plate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is, is the one glitchy part of, of bold. And that is, um, getting a unique code for that data set um, that it's happy with. You can only use letters. You have to have at least four. You can't have more than eight. And it has to be unique. And it's not just the, the data sets um, and projects that, that we use. It's everybody that uses bold. <laughs> <laughs> and so you'll go and you'll type in something here and it says, no, you can't use it. It's not unique. <laughs> and so you start fishing around. You also have to have some idea of what you want to use for that, for that code because the user is also going to be using that to access the records. So you might want to use the, the project leaders or submitters initials, you know, as part of that acronym. Um, you may want to use, um, you know, the project acronym like South Sound Mycological Club is SSMC, you know, or something like that, right? Did I get the last letter right? Yes. Okay. Um, so, you know, but, but you can go around in circles on this for, for 20 minutes. <laughs> And forget what it was you were doing. Okay, down here, you want to check this box that says, do you want to make it public on bold? Um, and this is a step that, that you definitely want to do when, when you um, are going to publish this data set on GenBank. You're going to do the submission process. But it's a good idea to, to say yes, unless you're, you're working with somebody who says, I don't want my, like Biddy, I don't want my, my sequences available on bold yet. I want them private yet. Because <laughs> I'm working on publication from that, right? Um, I'm not sure I've done that, but I might have. <laughs> yes, you have. Um, the um, manager is the creator, in, in which case that's you. Um, so you start typing your, you know, the name that you use to log in and, and you'll pop up on a list and that's who you hit. Um, here, always, you, you get choices of adding additional people who have access. So, so you want to, at least give me access. Biddy, do you want to still have access? Can't hear you. Probably yes, because sometimes yeah. I am a troubleshooter. Yeah. And then you always want to put Maria Kuzmina, and you'll see after her name as it pops up, Masha. That's that's her nickname. That's that's what she goes by. But if you start typing Maria Kuzmina. You know, it'll pop up and then hit save. Um, if you want to see the list of your data sets, um, it's here on the left. And, and you'll see after you've created one, it actually has a DS in front of the name that you entered. 
So um, we have some fun dis ones. Um, okay. And then you see, here's one that Sigrid should recognize. That's the West Coast, West Coast Rare 10. Okay. Um, and that's DS Fund uh, 1214. I'm not sure why that number. Um, but. Um, it's that number, Jean, because that's what the um, one two one four will be. The uh, you know how how there's a fourth column after the uh -huh. information about each file. Uh -huh. There's the one that has a number in it. That's the data set number. Like for Lane County, it is ten fifty two is is our data set number. That's this one. Yeah. Okay. Um, now you see there's also some, um, you enter a title in back on the previous page. Um, and that is, there, this one here. That data set title, you should come to an agreement with the um, submitter or the the project leader, so and for, it should always include the number that is included. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if if you have a slide that that shows it. Um, yes, if you go to slide number three in your presentation, uh huh. Um, see this this tag that says extra information. That number will show up there if it's been put into a data set. Okay. And that's super important because um, I often will sort by that number because sometimes, just to give the example of Fungi of Lane County, which is the local group, 15 different people submit sequences through that, but it's all under the umbrella of the group collection. Um, and there have been three or four different submissions of data for the, for the group. That way I can put it all together. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, so let's go back here. So that's actually a really important thing is to make sure that a number, uh -huh. the same number that is used in those tags is in that name. Okay. And then you'll see a bunch of the ones that I did because I've been doing a lot of the um, Gen Bank submissions. Um, you also make a data set when you're getting ready to submit sequences to GenBank. And it's going to be a subset of the ones that are um, the ones that, that belong to a project or a submitter. Because you're going to have some failed sequences. You're going to have some that are contaminant sequences. Uh, and they're going to get thrown out. So you need to then make a new data set from that that's actually for the GenBank submission. And so you see GenBank submission and then that, that, um, that number. <laughs> so. So. Um, you can also, once, once you're the editor of a data set, you can then assign privileges to other people, which is how you give your project leader or um, contributor access. So in NAMP A, um, you open the project, um, you open project options, and then you hit modify project properties. And one of those project properties is um, assign users. And so um, if it's not somebody who's already got a set of data in um, 
Nambe or um, in this data set, you're going to have to add that user. But they should pop up from a pop up menu. Um, so if you start typing their name, you'll get a bunch of choices that, that you know, sort of match the name you've typed in, and then you select that one and hit that one. And then you can hit Analyze Sequences, and I'll show you as our last thing what that means. Um, view and Download Sequences, that you want to tick. Um, edit Sequence, no. <laughs> uh, edit Specimen. Yeah, probably not, but if it's somebody who, like, say, is an Alan Rockefeller, then you would say yes, or, or Steve Ness. Yeah, I've, I've given him editor capability. And that's for a project, not a data set. <laughs> um, you always add Maria Kuzmina. Um, nobody gets access to this one except um, this is probably a um, a bold data manager. Yeah, you just leave that alone, and then you hit save. Um, so you email the contributors that their ITS results have come in. You tell them what their NAMPE um, record numbers are. Uh, if they want to see them, they need to register or make a profile in bold and then tell you that they have a profile in bold. Tell them to use their real name. <laughs> yes. That's, that's very important. They need a real name, not their MO or, um, or INAT handle. And you, they need that for the GenBank submission and... <laughs> You need them to that to find them on a list, you know, to give them permission. Jean, um, has, uh -huh. I think all of this has been done for all of the records that are currently in bold, right? Alan, yeah, but has but we had everybody that their sequences have been. Actually, I'm not sure they've been in. No, we have a bunch of of new people who submitted sequences in this last batch that that are new to bold. Right, so this isn't done yet for a bunch of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, this is just a close up. You can add the users by clicking um, the green box, add users, um, and then assign the permitted roles with the blue ticks in the boxes. Um, We're gonna skip over that. Um, you're not gonna probably be having new projects. Um, that's moving records out of NAMPE and into a new project. Um, and I think we've reached the end. Stop share. I'm going to go to the next. Does anybody need a quick break? Yeah. That'd yeah. Be nice. let, let's take a quick right. break. I like your haircut, Lauren. Thank you. <laughs> when did you do yeah, that? I cut like seven inches off a few hours before our flight because I was like, I'm going to be really hot. So <laughs> yeah. I, I just took nine inches off of mine. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Allie cut it for me. <laughs> You did a good job. And my husband's the one been doing my hair for the for the last uh, year. Allie, Allie I love it. My backyard it was, barber. Allie said it was a French bob. Um, <laughs> I like your hair, Jean. That's good. Thanks. All right, so I'll be back in a minute. All right. And your hair, you left it long enough, you can tie it back. <laughs> Me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's important in the tropics. <laughs> yeah, I have really thick, thick hair, so it. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm glad I did it. It was I was starting to like it growing back because I had kept it short for a while, and I was like, it's nice to have it growing. But I just um, yeah. I'm glad I did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So have the, has the text been big enough for you all? Or do I need to go to slideshow? If you can go to slideshow, that'd be good because the words on the, when yeah. you have this, uh, are small. Site screenshotted are tiny. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is how to submit those sequences to GenBank and make them public on bold. Um, so we aim to make those sequences available as soon as we can, but that means the submitter and the ID validator need to agree. So once you get all of the ones in a series submitted by the same person, um, you know, in full agreement that they're ready to go, it, then you need to create that um, data set that, that will be used um, to make the Excel file that will, will then go off onto GenBank. Um, so sequences that are not public on GenBank are not detected by BLAST searches. Um, sequences that are not public on BOLD do do show up in bold ID searches, but they show up as private. Um, so, and it tells you how much of a percent match there is, but it doesn't tell you who sent that in, anything about it, where it was from, um, you know, other than, than what they called it. So it's functionally useless. Other than you know somebody else <laughs> submitted one that's matching yours. Okay. And it's it's but it's not totally useless. Sometimes I know, oh, Steve, he, I'm pretty sure he's got one already of this in there. Um, and I can see that it's showing up as, as private and it's like, oh yeah, I gotta go fish that one out. I'm pretty sure I know which one that is. Um, sequences can be made public and bold. And then they're only detected with a bold um, ID of what is my fungus, you know, basically the equivalent of a blast search, but they're not detected by a gen blank blast. Um, somebody who creates a profile in bold can go in and pull up the record, all of it, um, if you make it public in bold. Um, when you create a new data set containing records, particularly for the ones that, that you're just getting ready to, to export um, and submit to GenBank, check that box that says make the data set public. Um, the sequences that we produce on Bold, uh, we got a reduced sequencing rate. And part of that agreement is that we augment Bold's fungal library. Um, and that requires us to submit to GenBank um, within a year of Bold giving us a sequence, the production. Um, you can actually request a delay 
Um, that's usually done by researchers or students, um, you know, who are working on a dissertation that they're not ready to publish that yet, or they're publishing a, a paper that includes that and they don't want it being revealed yet. On the other hand, you can explain to people that even after it's submitted to GenBank via Bold, it's still yeah. a year before it shows up on GenBank. That's the next line, yeah. So it can sit in Bold for two years before anybody sees it. Yeah, yeah, which, which is, is usually enough. So um, when you hit that link that says, make it uh, public in Bold, you get a pop-up um, that says, do you want a DOI? A DOI is a digital object identifier web link. Um, and that's, that's a web publication that has a permanent address. Um, and you say yes. <laughs> um, and, and you want that so that Bold can send that to GenBank. Unfortunately, Bold can't send that in the original submission to GenBank because they don't have a field that's capable of sending web links. Um, and, and either that or, or it's uh, GenBank doesn't have a field that get, goes into that can accept those web links. Um, so that has to be done after uh, GenBank assigns numbers to the records, but you still want it, uh, and you want to add those to the records. Um, so let's say we want to add records um, to that uh, new data set. And that, that new gonna... data set has the number 1053 in it, showing That's right. under the extra information. And in the name, you want to be saying that it's um, for GenBank submission. So you know what that data set's for. Um, so you go in and you mark the sequences that are belong to the series. And then you go and you unmark, unflag the ones that failed or say contaminant um, or laboratory mix up. You know, something that tells you uh, that's not the right sequence. So here's this one that has zero because it's, it's failed. But it might say um, contaminant and still have a sequence in it. That means you got to go in and erase those so that there's no sequence showing up in the box and, and make sure that the flag still says contaminant, um, but you want to uncheck it. You don't want that going in the submission. Um, GenBank doesn't want things long, shorter than 150 bases. Bold may have a higher threshold. I can't remember what their threshold is. But you really um, want to erase the ones that are contaminated. For example, yeah. here's one, the Subortiporus biennis down at the bottom. It says contaminated, uh, but there's still sequence in there. Yeah. You go in th via the sequence page. You, t you touch this there one. under the NAMP A006, uh -huh. and you delete that sequence. You go into the box on edit sequence, and you say, delete, yeah. <laughs> erase, <laughs> and then save. The update, uh, or it says update, and, and, and you do that. Um, and then you, the reason some of these things that say contaminated still have a sequence in them is that if Biddy and I have been trying to figure out whether there was a screw up in bold uh, where, where they contaminated wells from a previous um, well on, on a plate map, or in some cases, we've actually had um, whole blocks of a submission where um, things got, got like reversed, what, 90 degrees? Basic, basically, the, you know, what it said was in the, in the well 
you know, was all transposed to, to a different set of wells. And if you're trying to track those, you, you want to know what it was somebody thought something was and where that sequence ended up. So that's why some of them got left in. So we're not going to mark those. We uncheck those. We've got a set um, that we're going to now save to that new data set that says it's for GenBank submission. This can be done in two steps. Um, or it can be done in one step with a shortcut. I've got instructions for doing the two-step. The only reason for doing the two-step is that it can be so, so glitchy on, on trying to get a code that, that um, Bold will accept, um, you know, that, that you may not want to have those data records marked while you're fiddling around trying to get a name that it will accept. Um, the shortcut, you just mark the records, choose options, put add records to a data set, hit the green new data set button, fill out the form and hit the add records button. So that's basically a review of what we just did with the previous, which was to make a data set that your user or project leader could access. Um, so this is the one step. You go into the console after you've marked those records. Um, this is the um, data console, which is um, the third layer in from the main console. You have your record list. Um, you hit add records to a data set. You fill out your form. Uh, Make sure you've got a title that includes that this is a uh, for GenBank submission and what that number was. <laughs> um, put you add others to give them access. Make sure you add Maria. Hit save. And um, if you have made it public, you get this message pop up. Um, you've elected to make the data set public. Please confirm you want to proceed. Um, it will be accessible on the bold public portal, portal within six business days. And you can retrieve the data set using this permanent URL. Um, and so you want to record what that URL is. Um, Okay, this is actually a URL that it'll generate for each and every record, but you're not gonna see that for six business days. Um, so it'll show up in the bold records. Um, and then there was all this. So that's the two-step process, which I'm not gonna go into. Uh, okay, now we're going to submit the data set to GenBank. So we're going to the bold main console. That's the first one out. Um, you see your data sets here. Um, and it, it'll show a short list, but you can ask it to show all data sets if it's not showing up. Um, we're looking for the one, it's not any of these. Uh, it's one of the ones that says uh, for GenBank submission, but basically let's say it was this one, you hit that link. Um, then you get these options. And, and believe me, this is much simpler than trying to submit to GenBank otherwise. Oh yes, it's very it's painful. It's a nightmare. It, it can take 
me two days to submit just a few sequences to Genbank. And, th and then they come up with endless questions to ask you about yeah. every record of which you have no idea what the answer is. <laughs> okay, so you don't want the view all records or the data set options, you want publication. And the first option there is submit to GenBank. So then you get this pub publish to GenBank pop-up form. So you have your publication title. Again, um, hopefully you have already come to an agreement what the project title is with the project leader. Uh, use that same title in the publication requesting a DOI. Um, fill in all the author's names, um, and then you have to mark the corresponding author. And um, if, if you were actually publishing a paper with sequences in it, you would put the draft title of your publication in instead. Yeah. But in, in this case, it's basically um, somebody's project, which they usually have a title when they submitted their sequences to Bold. So it's usually that. Or, or it can be the South so Sound Mycological Club, or it could be um, the High Grasabi of um, Puget South Sound. Sound. Huh? High Grasabi yeah. of Puget Sound, yeah. Puget Sound, yeah. Um, so this author list, first name, if there is a middle initial, last name. Um, and so who should be on that um, list? You need to see um, slide set three for who should be on the co-author list. Um, unless that's a, a slide that I eliminated. Basically, if you're the person putting this in, you need to be on that list and you should probably be the first author. And then if you're the first author, um, you're the corresponding author because you know the most about this data set that's going to um, GenBank. You hit the CA, which is corresponding author. So that means any questions coming back from Bold about this data set going to GenBank or any questions coming from GenBank that's not being answered by Bold is going to you, okay? Then you have not only the project leader, but if they have contributors. So all of those people who made a collection under that project, you know, so it was collected by X or Y or, yeah. Um, all of those people have to go on that list because we're not separating out um, collections by individual authors. It's only everybody that's within a project or submission is listed, so everybody's a co-author. You always have to include Maria Kuzmina so she can edit and troubleshoot. Um, you need to add me and Biddy so we can troubleshoot. Anybody who goes on this author list um, can, after it's published in GenBank or submitted in GenBank, can write an email to GenBank and say, we got the ID name wrong, could you change it to this? Or we now have um, a museum accession number, could you please add this accession number? Or could you add this OLE number to the, the uh, taxonomic notes field? <laughs> okay. Um, so anybody who is on that list can write an email to um, GenBank and request a change. Anybody who's not on that list can't. So it's very important you get the right people on there. 
So for the corresponding author, the person you put down, which should be you, you get all this contact information, including your email, phone number, all of that. Um, fill that in and hit the submit request. Anybody uh, have questions? No? Okay. It's fairly straightforward. It's just a lot of <laughs> filling in boxes. Um, so I'm going to unshare. Come back. Scoop. Put it back to here. Uh, last one is resources and help. This is really short. Robin says that she dropped out because her internet crapped out, but she can look at the videos. Okay. Um, this is so short, I'm not even going to um, put it on full screen. It's just that there are links to user manual, email addresses of, of contacts. So there's a fast facts on answers to frequently asked questions. There's a print handbook. So you can get a PDF, um, both the version four, which is a draft and version three. These are our main contact people and what they usually do. Um, and when you submit to GenBank, um, you'll usually hear from uh, Medina Rahulan. If you submit new names, um, you know, for records to be added to the bold um, database, you'll hear from Medina Rahulen. Um, and then a couple other people. Maria Kuzmina is our main contact um, for troubleshooting. Then I promise to take you on a little tour in bold. Let me share my screen. I am going to show one that's inside the um, records, and that is ID. Um, all right, let's do a validated one. So let's pick um, the sequence of this record. Now I have to unshare. Yep. You share. <laughs> She's a quick study. Yeah. OK, so we pulled up the sequence record. And I'm going to skim down here. We're not going to clear it. We're not going to edit it. We're going to identify that sequence in their full database. I'm going to stop so sharing. Share. This is a little bit. Remember that the bold database is a very much smaller version than if you're using GenBank. Yeah. But it can be useful. Yes. If you do want to do a quickie, except bold is so oh, slow, oh. as you can see, it's a lot slower than GenBank. Um, so there, there are a couple of, of things about ID sequence here. Um, you can set it up with the parameters to include GenBank sequences. It doesn't pull in all of them, but it pulls in certain ones. Um, and, and you can change the settings in terms of 
how it does the, the matches. Uh, so Lauren has played around with some of the stuff, um, you know, in her training. So it's possible she could um, find that useful. But it does pull in the um, the ones that, that are public and bold and private and bold that are not submitted to GenBank. And so since it's taking a year from when the submission after bold submits it to GenBank, it's still not public in, in GenBank. Um, you can still get some of those, those records pulled into an ID here in bold. As long as you made them public. <laughs> Particularly in our case, because so many of what we're dealing with are actually, you know, have never been put in GenBank before. Yeah. So are you seeing chromatograms or not? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't look so much at the score stuff. I go down here. This looks more like a, uh, a blast search results. So it's telling me that it's 98.87% similar to Amanita Velosa. It's pretty close to that on the second Velosa. And then we got some unID'd Amanitas. So that's a published one. This is a published one. Let's look and, at the first one. And now okay. again, you can see the advantage of, of GenBank where we now can look at these, at these phylogenetic trees and say, oh, that crocea is misidentified or maybe uh -huh. the others are misidentified. Uh -huh. Okay. So that's saying for that particular record, um, doesn't have a museum ID. It has a sample ID that looks like a gen bank. It is mined from gen bank. Okay. Um, tells you what it is. Um, tells you where it was collected in the U.S. California. Uh, it was collected by, in Star Valley. It doesn't have the collectors. Uh, has it was collected in Wyoming. Collected in Wyoming. It looks like it was submitted in California. Yeah, that's what's going on here. People get things in the wrong slots in, in submissions to GenBank. That's another advantage of going through bold is you get things in the right slots. Um, if you want to actually go into GenBank and blast that thing, that's a hot link. That's the gen bank record. So if you hit that, you can go straight into gen bank, into the, the blast submission form and hit submit, you know, blast search and you'll get all of the, the gen blank matches. So it's not totally useless. <laughs> So is that enough on that one? Um, we're gonna do another thing with bold. I'm gonna close screens. Um, you know that we don't see anything. I know. Okay. I'm, get, I'm gonna, <laughs> I, ha I have to close these screens to see what I'm doing. Um, okay, I'm still in bold. I've Going to go back um, to the main console. I'm going to go to Steve Ness's project. And now I'm going to open it for you. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. So I've gone one level in from the main console. I'm now, I've entered um, Steve's projects. I don't want to open view all records. I'm going down here to um, sequence analysis. Uh, and I'm going to hit on distance summary. Here I get the parameters. I leave the distance model the same. Do I need to reshare? Are you not seeing the pop-up? Correct. Yeah. You'll need to reshare. Okay. All right. Let me. Uh, I got to find you. <laughs> so this is one of the things that makes lecturing using Zoom a nightmare. You come back from this. Thank you for doing it nonetheless. Huh? Just thanks for, for doing this despite all the Zoom funky bits. The problem is, is I'm not seeing Zoom. Hit escape. All right. Or just, just on your keyboard, hit escape. Yeah. And it'll pop you out of where you are. It should just on your keyboard, not. I did. It's not. Okay. <laughs> I will. I'm yeah. going to stop your sharing and let you start over. <laughs> hey. Yeah, because I can't find you. You just oh. have to boss these things around. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I need to go back to my email. Actually, I need to go back to calendar, back to Thursday. Now I'm back in. <laughs> All right, share screen. Uh, and it should be... Why is it not allowing me to? That's okay. Now it's popping up. Distance summary. We're not seeing anything yet. There we go. Yeah. Um, move that to the side. So these are the parameters on on making that distance tree. Um, I can. Select an alignment option. Uh, I like muscle. I'm going to put muscle. Or you could leave it as the default. Um, length more than 200 base pairs, that's fine. Um, leave uh, that OK. Apply parameters. Now I'll have to. It, it stop might it sharing. might work. Um, it's always worth waiting to see if it works because sometimes yeah. it it allows uh -huh. you. Uh huh. So I'm waiting for the the. Okay. Um, in other words, what what Gene is showing us is how to make uh, phylogenetic trees in bold not just in um, GenBank. It's, a, it's actually not a phylogenetic tree. Well, it's a distance tree. It's Same a distance yeah. tree. Yeah, which is what you also get in. Yeah, in, uh, in, in the Gen, GenBank um, yep. tree widget. So um, 
And the reason it's not a phylogenetic tree is because it's just relative to your sequence. Yeah. So. Oh, we don't we don't want the download, do we? We want the tree. Or do we have to download these before we can do them? I don't know because I've I don't I don't bother to use this function in bold. Uh -huh. <laughs> because I figure I've already done it. You know, I already have the information from GenBank. Yeah. When I've made the slides. So there was a second option down there on um, under analyze. Um, but it's just something you can play with that will generate a tree. Uh, this is not looking Probably. that helpful. So I'm gonna go back. I am really glad that the tree function is now available in GenBank because being able to right away say, okay, it looks like this one, this one, and this one are misidentified. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's what a tree will do for you because um, It's useful to, to figure out um, okay, it was the one above. That's what I did wrong. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Let me go back to yeah, there you are. Um, you can pick up in a new batch of sequences that have just come in, which ones are likely to be contaminants. Um, it's the taxon ID tree that I just hit on. Did you see where I yep. hit that? Okay, I'm gonna stop share, I'm gonna share the new one. This is what we're sharing now. Okay, so we've got the taxon ID. This one, I don't like neighbor joining. Um, but that's how it's going to build it. I don't have a choice. Uh, select alignment, I do like muscle. Um, And let's put sample ID, sequence processor ID, field ID. Um, collection code, do we want that? No. No, just those three. Yeah. Okay. Um, and build a tree. I'm going to stop sharing. It's still cranking. <laughs> I think it's it's worth talking a little bit about how you identify if a sequence is a contaminant. Um, I mean, the the first clue is if you if the user thinks it's a boletus and the sequence is a mycena. <laughs> okay, really big mismatch, right? That's one way. Another way is very often, if it's a weird ascomycete genus you've never heard of, it's contaminated. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if it's unless somebody it's, put in a weird ascomycete. <laughs> but 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 then they would have said it somewhere probably. In the ID, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Their initial and, so, um, 
and typically those are, you know, molds that that got in probably on the gills or during the um, specimen preparation phase. Yeah. Um, and and what happens is that if you have very poor um, DNA quality and quantity in the sample that was submitted, um, when, when the amplification stage gets to it, you got a few spores that have really good DNA that were contaminants and you've got crappy DNA from the original sample, what it's gonna amplify is the contaminant. You'll often see short sequences, poor quality sequences, or these sequences that, yeah, I can salvage it, but you know, it, it's got like 300 or 400 or 500 base pairs, but wait a minute, this thing is, is saying it, it's going in with trichoderma, you know, or <laughs> something totally unrelated. And, and uh, so we, we just had a situation where a whole plate, and this is the first time this has happened with bulb, but there were a lot of failed sequences. And then sporadically, there would be a sequence that was just plain something weird. And so I looked at it and thought, and then when I would go in and look at the sequences, you could see that the machine started to read, there were a couple of peaks and then it went, then it flatlined. So that to me said there was a machine error in the sequence processing. Um, and I looked at a whole bunch of sequences across the whole plate and it was the same throughout. So that's, that's when I wrote to Maria and said, or Masha and said, no, we have a problem. And fortunately, it appears that they did keep the um, extracts. They had gotten perfectly good PCRs. So it wasn't a PCR problem. It was a sequencing machine problem. Yeah. But, but now the, the way I could tell was that there were all of these failed and contaminants. And yeah. unfortunately, that was a case where two thirds of the samples were in these separate projects. So I didn't see all 96 of them at once. That would have been a really big clue. Instead, I had to piece through each separate project in order to sort it out. Uh -huh. Now we had another project leader who submitted um, 20 or 40 uh, specimens for sequencing that were from herbarium records. And, and these were older and DNA can break down with age. And you usually use different techniques, you know, if you're dealing with old herbarium collections, but they decided to send them in and give it a shot. So because the DNA wasn't amplifying any sort of little mold, either in the herbarium specimen or contaminant when they were sticking them in the wells, that was what amplified. Um, so, so basically the entire set came up as, as um, as weird ask of my weird ask of <laughs> <laughs> and this somebody, uh, could huh? start, somebody could start a project on their own uh, with all the weird ascos that have come back as contam that could be its own <laughs> project with all the sequence data now we've got oh one one thing you should be aware of i don't know what was submitted in this this last batch you know because because how many plates are we waiting for six midi yeah, I think there's still six to come and there's at least four or five in there now that we haven't looked at at all. Yeah, so there's about 10 plates in there that, that need to be dealt, dealt with. Okay, if somebody has submitted um, one of these discomycetes like a Morcella, Morels, um, or a Paziza, or something like, like that in the ascomycetes, um, you, you oftentimes cannot get a, a good match in GenBank. Um, and it's, it's not because the sequence is not good. You can go in there, you can look at it front to back, back to front, looks great. You know, it's got like 900 base pairs instead of the usual 650 or close to 700. So what's going on here? That group of fungi have um, 
bits of parasitic DNA that have inserted themselves into um, you know, the, the ITS. And it inserts in other parts of the genome, genome also. Uh, these are called introns. And so that's why these sequences are coming out so long. But um, sometimes when people send those into GenBank, um, you know, it may be that the sample that they had didn't have the, the intron, the parasitic DNA. So they got, you know, a clean, shorter sequence. Or they looked, said, oh, this is an intron. I know this is an intron because when I take this chunk that doesn't match with anything and I blast it, I come up with these other things that identifies it as an intron. And it's pretty common in this group. <laughs> um, so they delete it out of the sequence and then that's what they put up on Jembe. <laughs> and so when you get those, you cannot deal with them. If you see something that's way over 700 base pairs and it's in that discomycete group, just send it to Matt Smith's lab, Roseanne Healy because they know what the interons are. Like. They, they know how to deal with these things. You're gonna not even be able to, to do the matches in, in GenBank with these things. So, uh, I mean, I, th I think Morels is a really good group to, to talk generally about because um, <laughs> that's also a case where there's been a huge amount of, of new, um, really good phylogenetic work many of the names that are in GenBank are wrong. Yeah. So you'll have to go to the literature using the, the GenBank um, accession numbers and also sometimes the um, collection number because that often it's the collection numbers that are in the trees. And then you can take your top match, find it in a tree and say, okay, it's this one. <laughs> I do that a lot, and I and I discovered that it was extremely helpful with the morels in particular because there's good new literature out. You know, McDonald's group has done a lot. Um, Car Carrie O'Donnell. O'Donnell, yes. <laughs> Not McDonald's. <laughs> it's because I'm I'm Scottish. It's the mix have to go in there. <laughs> so, yeah. But, but there are people that we can turn to for problems in these groups. Um, and, you know, if you've, you've got what looks like a good sequence, the, the best bet is to contact one of us and then we'll put you in contact with the correct expert um, and get some help. <laughs> Don't try and tackle it on your own if it's not, if it's not uh, behaving properly. Another thing that's quickly worth talking about is, um, you know, Jean and I are kind of moving into the consultant role and out of the active role. Um, and there really needs to be a couple of people who, and I would say for no more than a year, um, are kind of the, you know, the validators of what we've got. Um, I don't necessarily think that everybody should be doing what Jean and I have been doing because it's probably too much. Um, on the other hand, you know, going through make having having somebody like undergraduates are great for making the slides. Robin has done has been doing fine making slides, and then having somebody like Jack and Lauren who and Hart who you know, have more experience actually going through and looking at the slides saying, okay, mismatched. You can stick that note in that it's mismatched. The flag, yeah. You know, as a flag, yeah, a tag, a flag yeah. tag. Um, you know, and then it's a question of whether you want to go deeper <laughs> or if you just want to make sure that that sequence doesn't go to GenBank because it's not correctly named. Yeah. 
Exactly. Um, you know, because that that level, as long as somebody's made the slides for you, can happen. You can do that in probably under an hour for most sequences. Well, for a batch of sequences, you can go batch through the day. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then delete, delete the sequence out of the ones that are obviously some sort of contaminant or mismatch. Before they get submitted to GenBank, you might want to leave yeah. them in there initially until you decide, you know, is it worth going further on these? You know, mm -hmm. the ones that it's worth going further on is the, the rare fungi that are submitted. Um, they have clean sequence that yes. are, are blasting to something reasonable. <laughs> well, you know, oftentimes they won't. For example, the Bonardzuia will always go to the European name because the correct names are not yet True. There. And so you have- But, but it'll, it'll go to a Bonardzuia. It'll go to a Bonardzuia. So it's, it's not going to an Ascomycete mold. <laughs> correct, correct. So, you know, at least marking them as as mismatches or you know if it says it's the same thing that the person thought it was you can just put validated mm -hmm. that happens about one time out of a hundred <laughs> <laughs> i get a little higher <laughs> I mean, it's not very often <laughs> it depends a lot on the user yeah yeah i've and been working with they've submitted common yeah. things or uncommon things yeah so it doesn't look as if the bold uh, platform is, is going to produce this tree. Yeah, it says error with results. It says it's not going to do it. So we can forget about that. So just, yeah, generally we, we, we rely on GenBank. And, and I do think that having somebody making the slideshow, so Allie was incredibly efficient. She could make the base slideshow, you know, in a, in a couple hours. Other people take forever. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Hopefully you can find a couple of really efficient people to help make slides and then a couple more efficient people to go through and flag. Um, and then maybe one person to go through the flags and, and make decisions. And export data sets. Oh, yeah. there, there is an important step that I'm missing for um, the GenBank. So let me go back to the GenBank submissions and see where those slides got. Let's see. Uh, I need. And I, I do think it's important for people to make a commitment of, you know, six months or a year or something because, and it, otherwise it'll never happen. And there's a lot of sequences that we don't want to have go to GenBank contaminated or failed or, you know, really badly misidentified. You know, and then if you want to go the step deeper, the steps deeper, <laughs> and you have the time to devote, um, you know, that would be kind of the next level. Okay. I would recommend a first screening and then decision making. Gina okay. wanted to work as pairs. Like I would go through and um, make a first assessment, and then I would give her all the problem children, which wasn't yeah. very fair. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not all of the problem children, but quite a significant chunk of them. Uh huh. All right. I somehow must have gotten them out of. Um, out of the slide set. But basically, you've, you've made a data file, which is um, a data set, which only has the records that are being submitted to uh, GenBank. You're going to need to be able to um, 
actually, yeah. No, you when you when you work from that, I did show you the correct stuff. It's the name changes that you need to actually download into an Excel file because it's the Excel file that you have to upload for name changes within a database or a data set. You know what, Gene? We didn't go through that training. You didn't, okay. No, we didn't. That's like 2A or something maybe? Could, could be 2A. I think I, I thought I... You touched on it, but, the, but we didn't go yeah. through the whole training. All right. Um, and this is germane because I have about 150 name changes I need to make right now. <laughs> yeah. OK, so I need to find the name change one. How to update. It is. Up to, not that sequences, so let's try two. There it is, 2A, you're right. Okay. Um, I'm going to do the share, even if I make you bit dizzy with uh, flipping through slides to get to the right part. And I want to thank you guys for being patient with this whole process. Um, it's a lot of information, but there are now resources. You're doing us the favor. Yeah. <laughs> I think of it more as a, um, I mean, this is all part of our service to fund this, right? It's a commitment to the community. Well, you've already done a lot. I want to say probably more than anybody else. I think a lot of people didn't know how much we were doing, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Now I can see it though. All right, now you should have 2A up. Um, okay, so that was all. If you'd hit the slideshow button, it would, oh, when you get there, never mind. Yeah. All right, it's up in front of this. Okay, we did go over this, but it won't hurt to go over it. We um, started into it, but didn't go into detail. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's say you have your data set that you're going to ex that you want to do name changes in. Um, you want to mark your um, your records, and you want to download um, data to spreadsheets. And it'll save it as an XLS X spreadsheet in bold. Well, it'll show up for you. But that's the newer version of Excel. But their programming won't accept the newer version of Excel. So you have to go into your file, you know, by the, the name and do a save as and save it as an SLX, or XLS rather. I'm dyslexic, sorry. Um, without that X on the end, um, in order to get it into a version that you can upload into um, the update files. So you've done that. Um, and you can you can basically tell it to do all of these things down here at the bottom: the lab sheet, the voucher info, info, the taxonomy, the tags. You at least want the tags, the taxonomy, um, and the uh, voucher info. The voucher info has like the name. That it was submitted under. It has the MO or INAT number. Taxonomy has the name that you're changing. The tags are really important because that has 
things like gene ad lectocalibia cf angiospermarum to bold db. Okay, that tells me what it is I'm supposed to be doing <laughs> with this data stream. Um, and over here, um, this is the taxonomy tab open. And you see lactocalibia is in there. That was entered by the person who submitted. Well, no, that was actually changed by me, but I could change that one in the edit screen and um, because they had lactocalibia in their database. So I could select it, but they didn't have angiospermarum because that's that neotropical one that popped up in Ohio. So I have to add that one in here. So this tags field tells me I need to add lactocalibia CF angiospermarum um, in here. And you put the whole um, the whole name, Lactocalibia CF angiospermarum. This over here in tags, it always puts in an underscore between words. So you have to delete those out. Um, but it makes things a whole lot easier. <laughs> um, so Otherwise, you end up having to copy and paste everything out of yeah. bold, and it takes forever. If you're doing it for a single yeah. one, not a big deal, but you want to use the download functions as much as you can. Yeah. Actually, species, it is just the CF angios from our, um, There's another one with name, which you have to do the whole name. Um, so here's a whole batch of them that I've gotten ready to do an update. Um, and I'm ready to upload it for the update on names. Um, and I've gone in and I've colored. Um, you see that, that the species is now the full name. It's, it's because a species is genus species. It's not the species epithet. Okay. So it has the whole name with the CF, and I've colored everything that I'm changing with red so that I can double check this when I get the results back. Then after it's submitted, I'll go back and proof it against what each of these records are now saying for the species ID. And this one failed it was not coming up as the new one. So I had to go back and do it again. <laughs> so, so each okay. time I get a positive, I go through and, and put the highlights so I know which one I've got to do again. Note that um, for the batch uploads, we then submit the spreadsheet to Maduna. So it's uh, we don't we don't actually do the updates within Bold. No. We submit it to the people at Bold who do it for us. Right, but that will automatically go to Maduna right. when you use the batch upload from the main console. And so, ah. so okay. I don't even have to do an email. I can just do it within this. That's right. No, Perfect. you don't want to do it by email. You want to go to the main console. Gotcha. And um, in here, um, record list. Um, and then the next choice is you pick your project um, and you don't open the project, but just under project, we're still in the main bold database. If you hit that button, you get these choices and one of them is uploads. And so if you hit that, you get this part on the right where you get more choices within uploads. And um, in this case, we don't want specimen images, we want um, specimen data, okay. Um, 
it's the first choice there. And if you pick that, you get um, this pop-up. Um, it says, initiate a batch submission. Yes. Um, so sample ID, you don't want to deal with these. You want to hit the initiate a batch submission. Okay. And then um, you do want this ticked, update existing records, and hit next. These fields were, would be if you were individually a single record changing. Okay. Now, um, make sure, double check that the, the file that you're going to upload is that XLS. Um, you want to tick the, the box that says um, taxonomy update only or hit that. You don't need high priority. Here's where you type in taxonomy update only in here. And then you hit submit. And then that's the proofing stage. And that's it. It will tell you with a little pop-up that you've successfully submitted an update. So one, one, one thing also that I would do is when you're updating, um, do absolutely make sure that things are spelled correctly. Use index fungorum to verify that. Uh, and sometimes, you know, if there's a difference between how index fungorum has something classified and how bold has something classified, um, you'll f pick that up when you're looking at index fungorum and you're gonna wanna believe index fungorum, not bold. But it may mean that you have to ask bold to change okay. their their yeah. base taxonomy, and that's a more difficult thing. That's the one that has to be done in two steps because, um, well, if it's if it's a species problem and and your name has been synonymized under another species, you put in that species, and they come back at you saying, "No, it should it should be this," and then you have to show based on index fungorum that. No, this is a valid name that's been validly published. It's legitimate. It, we think it was incorrectly synonymized under this other species. Um, but when you have to go to the two-step is if they don't have the genus in their database. And so then you have to ask them to put the genus in their database and, and then gives them the the snapshots of the um, or screenshots of the index fungorum fields um, so that they see that it was you know it's really up there um, and then after they've added that one to the their database and it shows up in that record then you can go through and add the species and request the species be added <laughs> and you'll need to do this step for roughly 10% of our sequences. Yeah. Yep. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's about what it's worked out to. Yeah. yeah. Right. But at least you're getting really interesting specimens and not just oh, yeah. boring old things. Oh, no, yeah. it, it's definitely very challenging mm -hmm. and very interesting. You know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that uh, mycologists will say, oh, well, I'm sure that the clubs just submit, you know, a, a zillion hygrophorus. Um, or she's a film community, and initially right. they did. <laughs> but now virtually everything we get is something difficult or 
you know, some clubs like like my 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 club has decided that they want some sequences of common things just to make sure that they're yeah. that they're not different from those in California. Um, but yeah, by and large, we get a lot of really interesting fungi yeah. that are not in in GenBank. Wow! One day we're going to have to do a publication. I know you're all busy, but like in five years, we can do a really nice paper on the amazing stuff that you guys have been even, you know even naming. a year or mm -hmm. a year and a half from now i'll be a little bit less busy but right mm -hmm. now i'm yeah i am no. swamped i think probably in the two three year horizon is, is mm -hmm. realistic for putting it in i agree mm -hmm. and it would be a really fun thing to do because mm -hmm. um by then the sequences will be out in gen bank and then we can talk about them right yeah okay. all right any last questions Ooh. I have uh, one resource I'd like to share if I could do a quick screen share. Yeah, you, you should have permission. Okie doke. So um, Michael Bank has a pairwise alignment feature that's pretty easy to use. And it's another backup. You know, it's, it's kind of in the caliber of Unite, where uh -huh. it's something you do after you've done old and GBIF and whatnot. But so I have gone to our Michael map records doc and I copied a sequence and you can go to identification and I do the pairwise DNA alignments uh -huh. and then it searches all of these at the same time uh -huh. so you can actually cut out your unite if you want and just come here uh -huh. um, can, can you do batch loads you cannot you cannot. So, so, so in general, I, I do a batch. If I'm going to do it, I would upload a batch a batch load to GenBank and a batch load to Unite. Right, right. So uh, this is just unless there's really an curious. option for it. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. I'm glad to know that, that I haven't seen. So uh, and just there's a little quirk. So you paste your sequence. Uh -huh. You click the button saying <laughs> you read things you didn't, uh -huh. and then uh, you start alignment. Uh huh. And so at first it gives you things that don't look too good, you uh -huh. know, 50%. And then what it's doing is it's loading from all these different databases. Oh, wow. And so it, really it refreshes cool. and it takes like, it just takes like usually under a minute, but you'll see wow. there it updated with something else coming in. Huh. Um, That's great. And yeah. yeah. So give it, give it a minute or two minutes sometimes before, if you're still seeing just 70%. Uh -huh. um, but then you can sort with overlap and you can show alignments. Um, and apparently you can draw trees, which I have not done on this. So I don't know of their quality, but um, yeah, this is just another feature to. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure that it's distance trees again, which is useful. Absolutely yeah. useful. Just yeah. not, not exactly a phylogenetic tree. So it looks like they've got a Different bunch models. of models. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And I and I, you know what I I can only say I know a couple of these but I'm yeah. sure that some people use them, uh -huh. um, but yeah you cannot then pull up alignments for particular areas and whatnot. It's just one more resource resource I wanted to share. Um, that's that's great. Can, can you back up to where you access the this? Sure. So it's on the Microbank database. Uh -huh. Yeah. And under identification. Okay. Mm -hmm. Neat. Pairwise DNA okay. alignments. All right. Yeah. And Can you I show us click this that, one? So. That DNA um, analysis that that will take both the forward and the backward reverse reads to give you a, be able to work with consensus. What's that? There was some sort of DNA. Oh, DNA uh, subway. Subway. Oh, oh, that's you. That's that's, that's that, yeah. That that's came for me. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can Can you show us that? Sure. Hang on. Let me actually try and find this. There you go. Um, free re free resources are always valuable. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> you know, and I, I I think I think that the reason programs like Genius are so expensive is because you know all the molecular biology labs use it, um, and they get lots of money from NIH which we don't get. <laughs> right, so uh, so basically you have to enter as a guest or you, you can enter and create a login, but you can just enter as a guest. 
And then for uh, pairwise alignment, um, uh, then you have to pick uh, the you know DNA, and then you can either just enter the sequence in the faster format, or you can upload your files. I don't have any handy, um, but why why are you using DNA instead of mtDNA? I have no idea what mtDNA is. Mitochondrial. Oh, oh, okay, maybe that's. I mean, I just always just use DNA, and then I and it works. In, yeah, okay. and I paste in my two uh, the two uh -huh. sequences I'm trying to align, and then I continue, and then it basically uh, creates this pair and then it asks you, do you want to pair? Do you want can, to can you paste in a C uh, yeah, forward and back read? No, it to... actually also has barcode and it says ITS. So you could really tell it which sequences you have. Oh yeah, that would be better. On I the don't right have top. anything super handy because I always just I do can, forwards because I'm cheap. I can but... put one in uh, the chat for you, Sigrid. Okay. Uh -huh. So if, if you can copy, that should be a systolepiota. Okay. Seminuda. Okay, so this is the forward that you pasted? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay. So. okay, so you have to put the little carrot. Okay. Yeah, so hang on. And then, oh, and the name you say forward and reverse, okay. And now do you have a reverse for that guy? I do not. Um, yeah, because I have no. loads of forwards myself, but I don't have any reverses handy. Oh, you pop both in like that. Gotcha. Um, you could tell it that it's yeah. ITS in the little box up above. I could yeah. tell it that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then basically it just asks if you want to uh, if you want to create a consensus sequence and then it does it and it highlights all the places where it's not the same and creates a consensus sequence that you can just sort of cut paste. Um, I wish I prepared for this, but um, so, so it creates a consensus sequence. Do you actually? Okay, but it doesn't. Um, you're not seeing that consensus sequence with a chromatogram you're not uploading yeah no it doesn't file. create a chromatogram but it it does tell you obviously where the differences are and then uh -huh. you'd have to go back to your chromatogram. oh wait file. look down below you can import trace sequences it import trace files yep oh i've never done that so okay you guys already know much much more about this than i do um but it's free so so then it should make the consensus from that and you should be able to see the chromatogram yep and eyeball it whether you you want to say nee, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do sure. that tonight i'm gonna actually try that i didn't even notice that i didn't even know that was a thing but yeah but it's it's called um dna subway dna subway yeah okay. uh, the new yorker using a subway uh, format website of course. <laughs> yeah. it's really it's popular with, with high train. school kids mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, that's really cool, but you ought to you ought to make that as a as like a YouTube video and then put it up on the Fundis website. Great idea, yeah. Because for people who don't want to spend a thousand bucks on, yeah, yeah. But you could do the short version, you know, do the 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 matching and then do the the other one, which is doing the consensus sequence. Um, you know, either with the putting in the forward and back read sequences or uploading the the chromatograms. Trace right. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, play with it tonight. You've given me some ideas. Uh -huh. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Well, and I'm I'm really glad to know about these other tricks in in uh, uh, Michael yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah. So. And pulling in from all those some. databases is good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. I uh, I got to run, folks. I but I do appreciate all the information, and uh, I will, you know, I'll work on getting a page set up for everybody. Okay. All right. All righty. Got well, the rooster you. in the background. I heard him. <laughs> Said time's up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right. See you later. All right. all right. Take take care, everybody, and thank you. Yeah, and please share the recordings when they come out because I want to go over them again. And also, Gary Taylor was really interested about watching them. Do you mind if I forward it to? Uh... Oh, please, yeah. Okay. I think I think yeah. we should just make all of this available to anybody yeah. on Fundus who's interested.
Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's one idea. of our paraprofessionals. So. I, I told him that you said nice things about him. He would he blushed. Yeah. Who is this? <laughs> uh, Gary Taylor. Oh, he's yeah. just a really wonderful um, amateur, but super serious about it. I, I wouldn't even better. call Garrett an amateur at this point. I call him paraprofessional because right. I'm, yeah. yep. I have almost never seen him make a mistake. <laughs> yeah. No, he's really good. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And catch up soon, I'm sure, Jean. <laughs> so, thank you, guys, very much. Thanks right. again. Yeah, this was Take really care. wonderful. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Bye, everyone.